What I'm going to talk about today is uh, some work that we've done on an on a, on a application called ThreadFix. And I want to talk about the ecosystem that we have of working with different vendors in the application security space, uh, working with different volunteers and contributors that have contributed to the open source side of, the, of, of, of that application, uh, and the different versions that we've released. And I want to go through and, uh, and kind of highlight a couple of organizations, different organizations that have been uh, instrumental in getting us to where we've been with that. Um, a little bit of background to be, by, by me, uh, I'm Dan Cornell, I'm the CTO of Denim Group, one of the founders, um, and I'm a software developer by background, originally in Java, uh, after that in, in .NET. I'm a consultant, so I have touched a little bit of everything along the way, and, and I help run the OWASP San Antonio chapter. Um, I'll skip over that. So I um, want to talk a little bit about what ThreadFix is uh, and how we see organizations using it. Uh, then I want to talk about some work we've done with the uh, U.S. Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate. I uh, want to talk about some of the vendors we've worked with that have been contributors to our efforts. Uh, and then want to talk about some of the both corporate and individual sponsors uh, and, and supporters that have helped with this. Uh, and talk about some of the things we're doing next. Um, and one disclaimer I have just because I'm talking about other organizations, like this presentation reflects my opinions uh, and is not, uh, you know, should not be construed as being endorsed by DHS or any other sponsor or contributor. Um, you know, this is all, uh, this is my view on things. Um, their, their mileage may vary. So what ThreadFix lets organizations do is basically to take the results of all the different testing activities, all the, all the stuff you're doing to test the security of software, to pull that into one central location and clean it up and give you a centralized view into that software, and then to present that cleaned up view to other stakeholders. Uh, you know, the kind of most specific stakeholder that we try to work with is the software developers, uh, but also looking up the chain into management and risk folks. Um, <coughs> kind of more specifically, what, what can you do with ThreadFix that lets you create a consolidated view of your applications and vulnerabilities, uh, prioritize the application risk decisions based on data rather than just on uh, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt or guessing, and then it lets you translate these vulnerabilities over to developers and the tools that they're already using, with the goal being to reduce as much friction as possible from the remediation process. So to drill a little bit more specifically into this, it'll let you create a consolidated view of your vulnerabilities. Uh, so by that, what I mean is it lets you lay out, here's my entire portfolio of applications. These are all the teams we have developing software. These are all of the applications each team is responsible for. <clears throat> And for that, then you can load in the results of all the testing you're doing. If you're doing static testing with, uh, with, with whatever, whatever tools, if you're doing dynamic testing with whatever tools, if you're doing uh, manual code reviews and penetration testing, if you have third party uh, you know, penetration testing, you can load all of that data into one central location. And ThreadFix cleans up and normalizes that data and dedupes it. And so if you're running multiple dynamic scanners or multiple static scanners, or as we'll see in some cases, running uh, dynamic and static scanners, it cleans up that data and will present you with a single unified view. Uh, so you can uh, you know, load all this data in and it will say, you know, like, hey, this, this cross-site scripting vulnerability is one that was found by Burp Suite and AppScan. So instead of that being two different findings that have to be individually triaged, this gives you, you know, essentially, hey, here's one vulnerability and we have multiple pieces of evidence about that vulnerability to present to your security analysts when they're doing triage. You know, from that, then, it lets you prioritize the decisions that you have to make based on data. You have all of this data in one central location and in a structured format, and so you can start to slice and dice this data. Say, so, well, let's go and look at my most important applications first, or for a given application. First, I want to look at the vulnerabilities that have been identified by you know, one or more tools, or you know, two or more tools. Maybe I think those are less likely to be false positives. I think those are you know, more serious because they're easy to find with automation. Uh, you know, whatever it might be, it lets you slice and dice this data to figure out which vulnerabilities are we really honestly concerned about? <clears throat> because you know, I don't know any organization that feels like they're overstaffed in the security department. I don't know any organization that feels like they've fixed enough of the vulnerabilities that they've identified. So you have to make some hard decisions. And the idea here is to get all of this vulnerability data across your portfolio in one central location so that you can make decisions about how to drive these through to resolution. And again, drew that unstructured data, giving you the ability to, to mine that data as opposed to, uh, you know, you know in, in a case where you don't have it in a structured s format, you know, just saying, well, I, I don't know. Let's uh, you know, let's do cross-site scripting first this week or something like that. And then finally, and, and this is I think really important. It lets you translate this vulnerability data 
that security people care about. It lets you translate this vulnerability data into the tools that developers are already using, most specifically their defect tracking tools. And so it lets you convert vulnerabilities that security people care about into software change requests or software bugs, which is what developers care about. You know, that's one of the things that we've found working with different organizations as they set up their application security programs and track progress. The one critical difference, you know, whether, the, whether this is done via ThreadFix or via some other means, the critical difference that we've seen between the software security programs that make progress and the ones that struggle is making that transition to go from vulnerabilities that security people care about to being software defects that the, that the developers care about. And that way, the security work lives alongside all of the other work that developers have to do. You know, new feature requests, non-security related bugs, performance issues, all of it lives in one place. And so security is no longer some magic special thing that developers do occasionally when somebody beats them up. Instead, that work flows alongside all of the other work that they need to do. Um, so when we, when we originally developed ThreadFix, we decided to release a, the, a community edition under an open source license. And we did this for a number of reasons. Um, you know, we thought that that would help get the technology in more people's hands. Um, we thought that it would help us to un unify what can often be a very fragmented vendor community. Um, and, and again, to get, uh, you know, to get more buy-in from the community looking at how do I manage a software security program? How do I, you know, and, and how should I structure this stuff? What are the best practices the industry has developed? And so in order to foster this type of community, we released it under an open source license or Mozilla. Uh, the code's hosted at Git GitHub. You know, we provide uh, community support via uh, Google Group. Um, we've got a, a REST API that you can use to facilitate a lot of different automation tasks. Uh, and then we've got a contribution model set up uh, similar, to, uh, you know, similar to the way that the MySQL folks worked with their contribution model. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And so what we've seen come out of this are uh, you know, a, a, a number of great examples of things that organizations are doing with ThreadFix that they are in a position to, to, to uh, speak about um, you know, much, more, uh, or, uh, much more openly. <clears throat> and so uh, you know, here we see an example of what is this? This is uh, some of the stuff the Pearson Educational Publishing folks are doing, looking at how they've built their uh, DevOps continuous integration pipeline with all of these different activities and technologies flow into ThreadFix and then flow out to other, uh, you know, other systems. Uh, similarly, we see the stuff that the folks at uh, Samsung uh, are doing with uh, their security automation, again, for their DevOps pipeline. Uh, you know, here we see the stuff that the Ally Financial folks are doing. Uh, and I'll have a very similar theme, which is we've got all these different testing activities. We're going to pump into one central location to get this cleaned up view of the vulnerability data. Uh, and then that gets pushed out into different systems and different stakeholders so that you're not asking developers to log into a security specific system to get their security work. You're giving them their security work in the systems they're already using. Or similarly, if you need to, you know, if you're looking to communicate application security information up to management, you're not telling them to log into yet another dashboard. You can pull that data via the API and push it out into the dashboards that they're already using. And that's also an important thing from a management standpoint. Uh, that we've found to be, uh, found to be very important. <clears throat> you need to be able to, or it's important to be able to uh, characterize the application security risk alongside of other risk management disciplines that organizations are better at, uh, better, better at managing right now. So you need your application security results to live alongside the results of your infrastructure and, uh, you know, and, and, and network testing. Uh, you know, I think organizations have different level of maturities in these different risk management disciplines, and I think an important step for organizations is to increase the awareness of application security risk by pumping this data into the systems that are already being used to manage risk. Um, one of the one of the big contributors to our efforts has been the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Director at Cybersecurity Division, which is the DHS SNT. Um, uh, whatever, uh, cybersecurity, CSD, and uh, we've done this via uh, an SBIR, or Small Business Innovation Research Contract. Um, <clears throat> and the SBIR is geared toward getting, uh, developing new technologies specifically for federal customers, but can also be commercialized in, in, in other ways as well. And this turned out to be a great uh, opportunity for us, and, and I think fits very much in line with the mission of that program, 
uh, because working with the DHS S&T folks, we've developed what we call our hybrid analysis mapping technology. And what that lets us do is map the results of static application security testing with dynamic application security testing. So for example, a static scan with a Fortify can be merged with a dynamic scan from like an, an app scan. And that was some, we'd done some work in this area, but it was something where we weren't quite sure the market demand and the investment that we'd have to make. And in winning that SBIR contract, uh, which we're now in year two of a phase two contract, in doing that, that gave us the uh, you know, top cover, as it were, to develop that technology. And now we've rolled that technology back into the open source product um, <clears throat> so that more organizations can take advantage of that. And so, again, this is my opinion, not DHS's opinion, but I think we had, um, you know, the, I, I think that was an excellent program, and I, th I feel like we, we've made excellent use of that, uh, of that program. So our initial goal with the hybrid analysis mapping was to allow for the correlation between static and dynamic testing results. Uh, and after we made that work, we found that we could do other stuff with the technology. And so again, originally we were looking to merge results from Fortify with AppScan standard. Uh, <clears throat> everybody here is familiar with dynamic application security testing? Excellent, good. Okay, if not, I'll be in the hallway after this. Can, we can certainly talk through it. Uh, everybody also familiar with static application security testing? Fantastic. <clears throat> Um, and so to do that, we did a lot of work to standardize vulnerability types where we use the MITRE CWE. MITRE CWE is like the democracy of vulnerability taxonomies. It's the worst available one except for all the other ones. Um, and I, I say that to, the, uh, you know, to uh, all the MITRE people and they usually, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's actually been uh, you know, very, very effective for us. A lot of the tools already have mappings to that and whatnot. Um, and basically what we do is we build an attack surface model of the application. We do a very lightweight static analysis and do a uh, you know and build an attack surface model where we detect the language and framework and identify these are all the URLs this application will respond to and these are all the parameters that can change the behavior of the application and we keep track for each of those entry points the entry line of source code or the entry point in the source code that is responsible for that particular piece of attack surface <clears throat> um, so you know, for this, we use the uh, you know, source code. We do language and framework detection, and uh, some of the static tools package some additional meta information uh, or metadata that we can use as well. And so we roll all that into a model. Um, in theory, we can. Th this this works in certain situations. We don't when we don't have full access to the source code. We can just use the source that's been packaged, um, you know, inside of the uh, SAST results. But uh, but really, to get good results, we do need to have the access to the source code for the application. And again, from this, we build this unified endpoint database. <clears throat> uh, and to do the merging, we basically say, hey, I have a reflected cross-site scripting in login.jsp for the username parameter. We query the database, and it says, <clears throat> you know, I've got, uh, you know, this is a Java and Spring application. I have a, uh, you know, the, the entry point for this is com.whatever.whatever.logincontroller.java at line 62. And you know, then we can look at the static results and say, oh, we've got a reflected cross-site scripting vulnerability that enters the application at logincontroller.java at line 62. I believe that this is two pieces of evidence about a single vulnerability as opposed to being two independent findings. <clears throat> um, what we've also been able to do with that, and this is one of the cool things that came out of this, and I guess is the point of, of, of research, uh, is that we found that we could do some other interesting stuff. So for example, from this endpoint database, we can basically run a select star operation, and that gives us a map of the entire web application and all the different points on the attack surface, right? So it essentially takes the spidering process that most dynamic tools go through, where they're guessing and using evidence from HTML and JavaScript to build out that attack surface, we can jump past that and say, we've already identified all of the attack surface. Start your spidering based on this knowledge, and let's see if we can get better, uh, let's see if we can get better coverage. <clears throat> so that lets us pre-seed dynamic scan. So we've built plugins for like Zap and Burp and AppScan that allow you to point at the source code and start out with this. And this helps you identify situations where you've got like landing pages that link into the application, but you won't ever find any links out or hidden parameters, for example, like debug parameters or backdoors that developers might have put into the application that you're also not going to find you know, through the standard spidering process, but where the application will respond to these things. Um, 
What we can also do with that attack surface database is even if you haven't done, uh, you know, even if you haven't done static testing, if you have a dynamic result, you can map that to an entry point line of source code, uh, and that's interesting in situations where if you have again only done dynamic testing, but you need to give the developers a head start on where they need to go to look to remediate vulnerabilities, <clears throat> you have that information. So we've actually built plugins for Eclipse and IntelliJ and uh, Visual Studio .NET that allow you to pull that dynamic data, match it with the attack surface model, and say to the developers, hey, you know, this line of code is where you need to start looking. You know, that's still pretty early stage, uh, still pretty early stage stuff, uh, but, is, but is interesting, I think. Yep. Question, how are you doing the map of the dynamic to static? The dynamic to static? Yeah. Okay, that's where... So we have that attack surface model, and we take the dynamic result and say, where did this hit the application? We map that to the entry point line of code, and then we stitch that together, if available, with the start with the essentially the source function of the static. So it shows this request. You know, on the dynamic side, we have this request yielded this response, which we believe is evidence of vulnerability. And what we have is the the mapping via the database via the attack surface database. What's that? Mapping and entry to, yeah, and we map the entry point. And for our purposes, we really only care about the entry point because we just need to know where did this, where did this attack request hit the application. Um, and if it's the same vulnerability type, we make a guess that says, like, we believe that this is, you know, uh, you know again, unless there's like multiple source functions that start at that level, that lets us say this is where the request hit the application. The application, if you hit it right here, has this type of vulnerability. Therefore, we look at those two as evidence of the, you know, two pieces of evidence. Map network stuff. So, like, say this is the IP address of the server this application is uh, Not, not right now. That's that we're we're doing some work right now, uh, moving forward on that. But that's uh, for the for the stuff we've worked at for DHS. It is very software security or application security specific. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, okay, yeah, so uh, talked a little bit about scanner seeding. Again, we've built uh, plugins for uh, uh, app, uh, Zap and Burp Suite, and the AppScan plugin is actually, uh, is actually working right now. <coughs> Um, and again, we've also built these plugins for the ID. And again, these are pretty entry point. And one, one thing I will say is if you've got a static analysis tool and a uh, IDE plugin associated with that, that's probably going to provide you, or almost certainly going to provide you with a better experience because you know, it has the full control flow and stack flow trace, uh, or you know, controller data flow trace, and can look through each of those. You know, in our case, the situation we're looking at is I only have a dynamic scan result. So we can show the entry point. Um, but for developers, it's better to have that entry point than have no data at all, and they're just left to guess as to like, well, for this request, how does this actually affect the application? <clears throat> uh, we've also built a plugin for SonarCube, and that fits in with the uh, you know, kind of mantra of get these uh, results into the tools developers are already using. Uh, anybody here use SonarCube for uh, tracking? Anybody? You know, a couple folks. Uh, you know, so that's what we see on the development side. A lot of folks that are managing their technical backlog and metrics, that's handled through, uh, you know, typically they're reporting that in SonarCube. So this is a way to get your security metrics to live inside the tools that the development teams are already using. So, you, so your security backlog, as far as the security teams are concerned, live in those tools alongside of those other uh, things. <laughs> um, so just some final thoughts on the SBIR. Again, uh, we, we feel like it's a great use of the SBIR program. Uh, we were able to do what we originally set out to do and have built some other interesting things along the way. And so that was, uh, we're very thankful for the DHS folks uh, and their uh, you know, continued ongoing support of the work that we're doing. And we're excited to have the opportunity to make that available to uh, folks in the community as well. <clears throat> Um, one of the things we've also found is because we act as a consolidation point for a number of vendors' tools, um, we've had different vendors that have gotten involved in the project as well. Um, you know, and a great example of this is Virtual Forge. They're a, uh, they do static testing for SAP tools, um, you know, specifically like ABAP code. And what this lets them do is to allow folks to keep track of their SAP application testing alongside of their broader application security program. Uh, so they actually developed the plugin uh, or the support for their scanning tool um, so that their users can import the results and have those live alongside all of the other testing that people are doing. So it's not just, uh, we, we, here's what we're doing with ABAP code, and here's what we're doing everywhere else. Instead, everything all lives up in one place. 
Uh, similarly, a number of the web application firewall uh, vendors, uh, Riverbed, now, uh, now Brocade, and actually just as of this week, the Barracuda folks um, have developed support to create virtual patches from vulnerabilities imported into ThreadFix. You can generate virtual patch rules that can then be placed on their sensor devices, and it improves their detection model to hopefully, uh, you know, you're, you're to be able to block, uh, to be smarter about blocking attacks against known vulnerabilities in applications. Uh, we've got a number of both corporate and individual sponsors that have helped as well. And this is, again, uh, this is in no particular order. And uh, you know, I just want to proactively say thanks to all those folks. Uh, the, uh, the gang at Rackspace, you know, Rackspace, for folks that are familiar, a longtime supporter uh, and contributor to open source software. They were instrumental in getting OpenStack released under the open source, for example. Uh, and they developed and contributed uh, the initial version one support that we, that we have. And so version one is a cloud-based defect tracking or change management system uh, that they're using for some of their projects, and they you know, essentially built a connector just as we had already built connectors for Bugzilla, Jira, HP Quality Center, um, and so on, you know, a team foundation server. They developed that support because they needed it and contributed it back to the project. Uh, Axway um, is uh, you know, an API security or a API uh, consolidation security company, and they developed support uh, and contributed for, uh, for a Fortify SSC that we're still in the process of fully integrating. Um, and they've also gone through, we've got some standard dashboard widgets. They have different KPIs that they track, and so they have developed uh, the, these dashboard widgets that you can plug into ThreadFix and contributed those as well. And so that's great to see. Uh, you know, this is a, you know, a great example, and I think the next couple examples as well of, I feel like we've got a lot of great ideas of stuff that we develop, but really it's the practitioners, it's the folks that have to deal with this stuff on the ground every day that are the ones that often are going to have the best ideas. And so it's really cool to see them contributing, you know, saying, hey, this is a KPI that we found valuable to track in our organization. We're going to make this available so other folks can track it as well. Real quick question. So you consolidate the dynamic and static tools. Does Redfix, do you do any type of... Um, testing yourself software Okay, yeah, so are you asking if ThreadFix does any testing itself? Uh, no, ThreadFix doesn't do any testing itself right now. We might include some of that stuff, like some kind of, uh, and, and in other versions we do have some coordination and orchestration features, but the open source does not. Um, ThreadFix assumes that you have some sort of testing that's being done and then ingests the results of those testing. Uh -huh. What KPIs are you talking about? Um, so specifically in their case, they're looking at, um, I want to say that the things that they've contributed look at the um, triage rates that they've gone through, where they're saying, okay, well, we've, you know, we loaded in a result that has 1,000 results. What percentage of those have we been through to determine if they're true positives or false positives? You know, that's one of the things for their particular program was something that they were, their management was very interested in tracking. Improving the process. Uh, so they're improving the process. Or they have different things that they're looking at, and they, they've contributed those to look at like hey in addition to just the raw like finding of vulnerabilities you know that's cool but let's look at this secondary thing which is we have a process that says ingest the results triage them then turn them over to the developers then look at the at the uh, yeah, which is why, uh, again, uh, which is, it's, it's great to hear them be like, well, this is actually what we track. I'm like, oh, that probably is an important thing to track. Um, so, again, like the, uh, you know, we, we uh, sp spent a lot of time on road requirements and roadmap and things like that, but, uh, you know, opening this up to allow other folks to contribute has been really valuable for us to see what the, uh, you know, what the people actually responsible for this stuff uh, are worried about. Mm -hmm. Um, automation domination, a guy named Brandon Spruth, who I think is now at Splunk, um, he actually developed a Jenkins plugin for ThreadFix, uh, which is great because we see a lot of people pushing to include um, you know, results from, or to, to, to get a tighter integration between people's DevOps or continuous integration pipeline. Um, you know, what he found in, in the organization he was working at the time was they, were, they had achieved the goal of getting a lot of security testing pushed into the CI pipeline. And what he needed was a way to automatically uh, automatically connect those integration pipelines up with ThreadFix. Uh, so he built this Jenkins plugin that essentially says, hey, we've done all the security testing, grab these results, load them up into ThreadFix. And that's fantastic when you can flip the responsibility around like that, 
where as the developers do the stuff that they're doing, which is pushing out new builds, all that security intelligence just flows up into one centralized location. That's a uh, yeah, that's, that's 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 really cool. And again, a great example of uh, you know someone who said like, hey, in our organization, we've achieved uh, a measure of success getting these processes into the continuous integration pipeline. Let's better link development and security by taking the results of all the testing that the developers are doing and making sure that it's centrally available to the security folks. Uh, yeah. So do people, um, when they're doing automated security testing, do they, do they use thread fix to uh, pass or fail a build, or do they usually have the other tools to do that? Um, we see a lot of people wanting to move that direction, and that's probably, from a roadmap standpoint, that's probably the direction that we're going to go with the Jenkins plugin, is to give it a better ability. Like right now, it's, I, I, I don't want to characterize it as dumb, it's very straightforward where it says, show me where the files are, I'll pump them into ThreadFix. In the future, what we've looked at doing is saying, I'm going to take a, before I do something, I'm going to take a reading of ThreadFix, of, of like, for this application, what's its state? <clears throat> then if I load this data in, be able to set a policy that says, fail the build if we have any net new highs or criticals, right? Or, or, or no criticals at all, or whatever it might be. So that's, I think, the next evolution of what we're going to be seeing there is a better ability to, uh, to, to stop builds uh, based on those types of things. Uh, that's not where we're at right now, but that's, that's the direction that I think we're headed with that. Uh, excellent. Uh, good. Uh, so the Samsung folks also have uh, contributed a number of features to, uh, uh, to, to ThreadFix. <clears throat> uh, they've got a blog post that they put up, and these slides will all be available. Um, you know, and this is, again, great evidence of folks like looking at the usability of ThreadFix and saying, well, this is great, but I needed to do this. Uh, one of the big time savers that they've put together is a default system for defect submission. So as you bring these vulnerabilities in and want to create defects, <coughs> they built a system that essentially allows you to set defaults that you can override so that you don't have to re-enter the same information every time you create a defect. Uh, they've also done some cool stuff with uh, scheduling email reports so that ThreadFix can reach out and proactively send information out to folks. Uh, <coughs> they, uh, you know, b before the defect submissions were pretty uh, were, were actually hard coded because I wrote that part of the code. Um, we've steadily removed my efforts from ThreadFix, and it only makes it a better product, which is uh, which is good. That's now now maintained by professionals. Uh, but they, they instituted velocity templating, so you can be a lot more expressive and customized in the way you communicate vulnerability information to developers. Uh, and added uh, another link for submitting things. <coughs> Uh, also, the folks at Pearson Education, uh, they sponsored the development of a number of features. Uh, you know, they've developed a number of supporting tools, and, uh, and, and, and po possibly more important, they've uh, helped make some of our documentation less crappy, um, which is good. <clears throat> um, so there's, here's some links to a number of different things, uh, and you can just see the way that the Pearson folks have integrated uh, ThreadFix into their pipeline. And they're actually, uh, there were, uh, a two-part article came out last week on DevOps.com going into a little bit more detail some of the things that they've done. Um, and I'll, I'll get those links in here as well. Um, but they've done things like develop Go and Python libraries to talk to the ThreadFix API, uh, some check marks integration scripts. Um, you know, really, really useful stuff for people looking at driving a lot of automation with, uh, with ThreadFix. Um, and uh, running, running a little low on time, so we won't read through that whole list. But, uh, but again, what they've done is identified, hey, here's things that we need either in the API or in the user interface that's going to help us do the types of things that we're really pushing for from an automation standpoint. Um, you know, they've, uh, you know, they've either uh, you know, sponsored the development of that or, or done it themselves, and it's, uh, it's been tremendously valuable. <coughs> so uh, you know, uh, you know, what, what have we learned? One of the interesting things we've learned is, uh, and I saw this as a joke on Twitter a couple months ago, but running an open source project is free as in puppy. Right? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of work uh, in, in a lot of cases, but very rewarding. I don't know if for, for all the dog owners in the, uh, in the audience. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, uh, nobody seems to care too much about the specific license. Uh, one of the things that we've learned just from seeing feedback from the community is we need to be more API first in our development. Uh, you know, we've, uh, we, we've, we've, we've been API almost first, and that has given us a, a, a great API that allows for a lot of power. Um, but, uh, but, but really, when we see the most interesting uses that people find for ThreadFix, it's around this automation, it's around DevOps and continuous integration. And uh, you know, for, for us to really be 
successful in that space, we need to we need to really push the uh, the API. Uh, and again, uh, you know, having that uh, you know, having that community helps us drive innovation because it takes all the like totally awesome ideas we have in our office and it augments those with practitioners in different parts of the industry who have different constraints, different things that they're trying to accomplish. It gives us a much better feel for what folks running real application security programs need and helps us respond very quickly to, uh, to those. Uh, so if you want to contribute, great. Uh, we've got a contributor set up much like the MySQL folks have. Uh, oops. Uh, much like the MySQL folks have. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've got some important links for people to track down. And um, I think uh, I, I might have time for like one question if folks have it. And other than that, I'll probably, if folks have other questions, I can step out in the hall so we can let the next speaker get up and run in here. What's that? Yeah, I've got two more beers to go still. Actually, two and a half more beers. So uh, good. Any, any questions? All right. Well, good. Well, thank you all very much. And again, I'll be out here. If you